McGillicuddy and Murder's Pawn Shop. Season 5, Episode 7. Ghost in a Bottle. October 25th, 1921. Continued. With the ghost bottle tucked under my arm, I teleported back to the murder object to return to Wrath. I got back to the boat. It was deep, dark night now, thick and smelling of purple and watery with sound. I crept through the doorway and into the boat. My plan had been to wake Wrath and then venture out to finish this idea. Instead, I decided that I needed a bit of a nap after all. I set the ghost bottle down on the floor near my bunk. Wrath was still comfortably snoring, so I didn't think anything was wrong. Why would I? I climbed into bed, threw the covers over my head, only then remembered that I was still wearing my shoes, kicked them off, and was asleep in half a minute. All night long, I dreamed about the signs. This way to find the bodies. Signs that had led me to Ariana, and then to Renfield. This way to find the bodies. But I didn't find corpses. I found night enthusiasts. I woke in the morning with the eeriest feeling. For one thing, I had felt like I was back in my childhood bed, but not in a cozy way. It gave me a bad feeling, like, oh no, we've gone backwards. We're not supposed to be here, this isn't right. I rolled over and assured myself that all was well. A kind of green-tinged sunlight came in through the windows. The boat was a little warm and humid, but in a pleasant way. I could feel the motion of the river below me. I stared into the early morning shadows, across at Rath's bunk, and I tried to figure out where my bad feeling was coming from. Rath was still asleep. He wasn't snoring anymore, but I could see him breathing, so I wasn't too concerned. Perhaps he was out of his deep sleep and merely dozing. I should have calmed down, but I was still on edge. A strange sound had woken me. What was the sound? Why did I feel like something was wrong? Then, the sound happened again. Diary, it was such an ordinary sound. It should have been a common sound here, too, on the river. But it sent chills shooting through me. And I was so sure that something was wrong that I leapt out of bed. The sound was a drip. That's all, just drip. The plop of a thick substance hitting wood. Maybe... Maybe that's why it had woken me, why it felt wrong. Water is very thin, and there is ever so slight a difference in the sound that water makes when it hits, and the sound that something thicker makes when it falls. I was hearing something thicker than water. I scurried across the room, already seeing the flash of the future in front of my eyes. I couldn't see the drip, but I nudged Rath's curtain to the side a little bit, and there it was liquid and glowing on the floor. Blood. Magic unusual blood. But glowing, while it was liquid. Wrath was bleeding from a small cut in his finger. Strangely enough, it looked as if he had cut himself on himself. Some bits of wood in his hand were sticking out and jagged. The blood fell in rhythmic beads. Not too often, As long as I could hold my breath, it would stay still on the edge of his finger, gathering, and then when my lungs couldn't take it anymore and I had to breathe in, even though I was so scared, a new drop fell. He had lost about a quarter cup of blood already. It didn't really feel as scary because it didn't really feel like real blood. But there it was, dripping. I had to stop this wound. I got up my hanky and, in a jumble of nerves, began to wrap up Rath's finger. He was still asleep, and me grabbing his hand like that made him yell and spring away. Death to all mice! Rath shouted, loud, like it was a war cry. Then he linked at me, startled, and blinked. Oh, Maud, it's you. If I had felt sick before diary, it was worse now. I had decided to ignore what Rath had just said. I wondered if he even realized, even remembered. But it had come out of the most primal place in his soul. 
Uh, you're bleeding, I said. Here, let's get this fixed. Wrath stared down at where the glowing green was already sopping through my handkerchief. But that isn't blood, Maud. It's the wrong color. Don's blood was this color, I said. I didn't want to frighten him too much. When I found her. You mean, Wrath said, the cadaver did this to me. Changed my blood. He stared down at his finger. What does that mean? I had a ghoulish fear that this wound would never close, that there was something new and wrong about this blood. But after about a minute of applied pressure, the flow lessened. The wound would seal, at least. Oh, Maud, Wrath said. What if I'm not human anymore? We looked at each other. Then Wrath corrected himself, or I'm not human anymore in a different way. The cadaver changed something, I murmured. Ugh, I'd known this was too good to be true. A simple handshake, a rejoining of past and present selves. Wrath wasn't back to normal magically. This wasn't all good. Something strange had happened to him. The blood inside his veins was luminous. What if he was electric, alien, going to burn out? Why isn't there a manual for these things somewhere? If I had a dollar for every time something happened to me, but no one had any idea what was happening, well, I would be rich. I'd be as rich as a sailor who has just found buried treasure. Anyway, diary, it was like I was on a brand new planet with new rules and new possibilities. Everything was new, impossible. I couldn't take Wrath to a human doctor. They would lock him up, not to mention they would have no idea what to do or define about his wooden eye. Wrath, we are going to find out what's going on with you, I said. Why this happened? Perhaps it's only temporary. Maybe it's just the two pieces of you readjusting, and you'll go back to normal in a few days. But, Maud, I didn't cut my finger, Wrath said. I'm bleeding, but I didn't cut my finger. Something else did. Someone else did. I think that thing is still inside of me. Maybe it's angry. Maybe it wants to get back out. Wrath. It doesn't have a mind of its own, I said. It's you. Even though I knew nothing of the kind. We had let Wrath absorb a giant cadaver that looked just like him. But we didn't know what it was. I'm sure we'll work this out. But how? Oh, God. I knew who I needed. I knew exactly who I needed. And she was currently running around as a night enthusiast. It was time to put my ghost bottle to use. After Rath's finger stopped bleeding, I told him what I wanted to do. You're mad, he said, and then grinned toothily at me. He had a hungry look, like a fox. Well, at least someone loved my idea. I drew an eye symbol, and I sent Rath ahead to be sure the coast was clear. It only occurred to me after he left that it would take him a long time to teleport and get back out of time loops because I hadn't given him any magic jelly for a doorway back. But how could I, until he knew more about what was happening to him and his loyalties, than I didn't want him running off with some of the most powerful substance in the world. Wrath wasn't back in five minutes, so I decided to venture after him. I stepped through the eye symbol, and then there I was, as if I'd never left. The haunted house. Our hideout. Just before Ariana had turned everyone into night enthusiasts. Well, it was empty. Quiet. It was starting to feel broody and damp, the way it had been when I got it. I didn't hear anyone, but I also didn't see Wrath. Slowly, I climbed the staircase, and I began to imagine all sorts of monsters. Centipedes as tall as I was. Ghosts with long fingers. I didn't know why I was imagining ghosts as if they weren't real, as if tempting myself to be scared. This place was chock full of ghosts. One was about to pop out at me any minute, I could tell. I turned the corner, scared, 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 and then I saw something. It was Wrath. He was standing in the hallway, looking innocently around at the walls. Oh, hello, he said. You've been very slow. The coast is clear, I said. As a sheet of glass, he said. This place has been vacant for centuries. No, it hadn't. 
we wandered down the halls together. I got goosebumps. The last time I'd been here, I'd seen Mr. McGillicuddy the night enthusiast, and it had been like seeing the worst kind of monster. "'What are we doing here?' Rath whispered. "'Looking for ghosts,' I said. We continued to prowl down the hall. Every creak of wood was both promising and terrifying. "'Here, ghosty, ghosty,' I said. "'Maud,' Rath said. "'Why are you summoning specters?' "'Because specters could just be the solution to this whole mess,' I said. "'I have an inkling, but I need to collect one to find out. "'With your ghost bottle. "'Yes. "'For the putting in of ghosts. "'Yes. "'Who will then be angry and try to murder us. "'No,' I said. "'They won't. "'Besides, they keep begging me to return them to their bodies. "'I assume some potentially temporary housing will do.' "'Rath snatched my shoulder.' Maud, what are you thinking? Nothing, I said, nothing bad. His reaction had startled me, and here I'd been thinking that I was so clever. Are you going to stick that ghost into a human body? Rath stared at me, horrified. Um, I said. Maud, Rath said. I am standing before you the living proof that stuffing alien substances into living people is a terrible idea. What are you thinking? You're just going to create a possession willy-nilly? You're going to chuck a spirit into a body that already has a spirit and hope for the best? What if the ghost doesn't want to leave? What if the ghost is a murderer? Wrath had chilled me. I suddenly felt foolish, or even dangerous. Tyree, I do so hate when leaders do something pragmatic but unethical. I had been steering full steam ahead for pragmatic. What was I doing? Was I that kind of leader after all? Did I step on people to get the job done? I, I have a theory, I said, and if I'm right, then it's not as dangerous as it sounds. I don't think. You can't just go around sticking ghosts into people, Raph said. You can't. People have to agree to this sort of thing. Oh, no, I said, I am going to get consent first. You'll see. How? By having a chat with a night enthusiast? Letting them know you're alive while you ask for their permission to chuck a ghost into their body? Yes, I said precisely. I continued my journey back down the hall, smirking. Maud, Rath said. He scrambled after me. You can't let anyone know you're alive. <laughs> what did you go to all that trouble for? Hmm? What are you thinking? Rath, I said, I've got to try this. I refrained from adding, and you are half the reason why. We needed a doctor. I have no idea what's happening, but I don't like one shred of it, Rath said. You'll see. I said. Rath and I stepped into a room at the end of the hall. This one was rather lush compared to the rest of the house. Purple curtains and a gilded blue ceiling. Carpeting. It looked like a small ballroom. Even a throne room, if such a thing had still existed. I felt a prickle in the air. This was where I would find what I was looking for. Diary, this was a very solemn moment. I have not mentioned this theory for an instant but it has been brewing in my head for a very long time. I think I understand who the ghosts were, who the bodies were. I had dreamt about the signs all night, remember, this way to find the bodies, and I'd found night enthusiasts wherever I followed the signs. Could it be a solution, so quickly, waiting for me? I needed to summon ghosts, but really, I needed to summon one particular ghost. I walked to the center of the carpeted room, smelled a little bit like mold, and I tilted my head back and screamed. Wrath, in the corner, jumped about a foot in the air. Don't do that! Sorry, I said, but I'm not done yet. I stood in the middle of the carpet with my fists clenched, and I screamed over and over, My leg is bleeding! My leg is bleeding! I need a doctor! Not the most brilliant script in the world, but I think it would do the trick. I need a doctor! A moment later, the turquoise blue glow of many curious ghost heads poked out of the wall, like little busts looking down at us. None of the ghosts came into the room, however. They stayed on the side and watched. Not right then. They weren't who I wanted. Doctor! I yelled. And then, just like that, a tall ghost with a sharp nose rushed into the room. The ghost stared at me, hovering a foot off the ground. The ghost's posture was urgent, like it had come to help. 
Then it paused, confused, and slowly the urgency melted. The ghost turned away slowly, bewildered. Scotland, I said. The ghost stopped. She turned her head, confused. I met the ghost's eyes. She wasn't much like Scotland. All my ghosts had melting features, like they weren't human but wax on a hot day. This one was Scotland's height, though. The nose was right, the way the ghost stood. You're Scotland, I said, aren't you? She blinked at me. I don't think the ghost fully understood who she was or what she was doing here. You remember me, I said. My voice got shaky, diary. I couldn't help it. We were friends. About a week ago, someone chopped your soul in half. Your body and the rest of your soul is still out there, but you're here. You're the missing soul piece, aren't you? Scotland's empathy. Scotland's humanity. The ghost floated a little bit closer. She got close enough that there was a kind of smell, like singed cloth. She looked down into my eyes, frowning. Part of her gaze was vacant, hollow, like a corpse floating about. The other part of her gaze was sharp, searching, trying to remember. I suppose it was hard, when you're only a fragment of someone's soul, to remember what you are, or who you are, or why you are. It was funny, too, to think of something good, empathy, humanity, seeming so creepy and vacant. It was like without us, without a human to have the humanity, it became a lost and anxious void. No wonder they wanted their bodies back so badly. Assuming I was right about all of this. I remember you, Scotland's ghost said. I lost my shoe. Well, at first I was utterly confused by that, until I remembered the time in the night enthusiast prison that Scotland had snapped off the heel of her shoe. That was a moment that real Scotland had lived through. The ghosts in this haunted house hadn't been anywhere near us then. Only the real Scotland would have remembered something like that. So, I was right. This was the missing piece of Scotland's soul. I had done it. I had solved one of the mysteries, except... Tyree, I did have this horrible thought. What if this thing in front of me had nothing to do with Scotland? That was Wrath's fear. That it wasn't the missing soul piece at all, that it was a ghost. Feral. Cruel. A dead human or evil spirit roaming the halls. What if it was tricking me into thinking it was Scotland? What if it had somehow learned about the shoe thing? What if all of this was an elaborate trick? Return us to our bodies. Would that be a good thing or a bad thing? If I returned a ghost to their body, was this Scotland? Or not? I can return you to your body, I said. My voice trembled. In the corner, I saw Rath put his hands over his face. But I had to try this. If Scotland agreed, and this worked, it could be the answer to everything. Will you step into this bottle? I think that an evil ghost trying to fool me would have been very wary of tricks. But this ghost stepped straight towards the bottle and poked her finger into the open spout. This bottle could have ended up like a genie prison, a very dangerous prospect for a ghost. But it was like she was Scotland. And she trusted me. Like a bit of thin cloth being whisked through a keyhole, the ghost folded up and appeared a moment later inside the bottle, as nothing more than a swirling glow. I gently corked the bottle. The other ghosts looked at each other in confusion. What? I said. You asked me to return you to your bodies. With a ghost in a bottle, I left the haunted house. Rath came with me, but he kept giving me glares. It will be up to Scotland, I said. Who you shouldn't be talking to, Rath said. Diary, it's easier said than done to find someone. I couldn't very well stride into the Purgatory Club and ask for Scotland by name. Rath and I spent the rest of the day looking for her. Rath claimed he was looking for her whenever he teleported into Night Enthusiast establishments for me, but he probably wasn't. He hates this whole idea. But he is starting to glow, Diary. Glow. His skin is getting paler and more green. I need a doctor. He needs help. I am back in the boat at present. I will write more tomorrow. If I find her. October 30th, 1921. 
We lost quite a few days looking for her, and the delay was agonizing. For a while, Rath's condition seemed to be stabilizing, maybe even going back, but now he is worse than ever. Then I found her. At last. I found her going into a shop for medical supplies. I stepped in after her. No one else was present, apart from the shopkeeper. I cornered her in a back aisle, next to some glass jars and sneezy powders. Scotland, I said. She turned. Maud, she gasped. The disguise I had on was not good enough for my close friends. She gazed at me with wide eyes, nearly dropping the jar she held. Well, there it was. A night enthusiast knew I was alive. I have a proposition for you, I said. We hope you've enjoyed Season 5, Episode 7, Ghost in a Bottle, of McGillicuddy and Murder's Pawn Shop. McGillicuddy and Murder's Pawn Shop is written and performed by Minerva Sweeney Wren, all rights reserved. Thank you for continuing all this way with Maud's adventures. New audio dramas are coming, and there is news on those, as well as fandom fun, if you follow me on Instagram and Twitter, at Meg Macaulay Inc. That's Inc. I-N-K. Please consider becoming a monthly supporter on Patreon. Or, if you can't commit right now, say thank you with a one-time donation. I now have Venmo, at Minerva Sweeney Wren. All links are in the description of this episode. McGillicuddy and Murder's Pawn Shop will continue with Season 5, Episode 8, Ghost in a Friend. <laughs>